Hello, everybody, and welcome to another week. We're going to talk about the post-war, post-World War II international economy now. And we'll begin by talking about how Japan and Europe rebuild after World War II. And we'll start in Japan here. Uh, Japan was occupied by the United States after the war. The occupation lasted until 1951, so they were under direct U.S. direction during this time period uh, for about six years after the war. Uh, during the time, Japan is required to write a new constitution that they modeled on the United States' constitution, which made their emperor symbolic. And just to tell you who these two guys are, now that we've said him, this is Emperor Hirohito. He la he's the actual the emperor of Japan. Um, he's there for a, a really long time, before World War II, uh, and even up until... Jeez, was it the... I should have looked it up first. The 1970s or something? Yeah, like I said, Hirohito is alive until 1989, when he dies, his son is actually uh, currently the emperor of Japan. There's been some recent talk about whether or not he's going to abdicate uh, because he's just too old. His name is Akihito. So anyway, Hirohito here with General Douglas MacArthur, who we talked about during the during the Korean War. He's kind of a big deal uh, during that war. It has this feud with President Truman. So anyway, um, under this new constitution, the emperor becomes symbolic more than anything. Like the British monarchy, they're, they're symbolic more than anything now. Um, so this, uh, as part of this new democracy, by 1955, there's the creation of the party system, and the Liberal Democratic Party uh, takes charge. And that's don't be confused. The Liberal Democratic Party in uh, Japan is actually pretty conservative, and they are the majority party until 1993, pretty much. So it's this long period of stability with the Japanese government. By the 1960s. Japan had emerged as uh, a world industrial power despite the destruction of the war not that long before. Uh, there's a couple reasons for this. Partly it's due to the U.S. occupation and the support of the United States. There's no defense budget in Japan because as part of the, uh, the end of the war, the terms of the end of the war, Japan's not allowed to have a military. Uh, the United States pledged to defend them, so they don't have to spend any money on a military. The U.S. is also spending money on United States bases in Japan there. So that's helping the Japanese economy. There's some agricultural reforms. They can support themselves. The J Japanese farmers can support uh, all of Japan. And it's mechanized by this point, the 1950s and 60s. So some farmers can go to factories and work on um, industrial things there. Uh, there's a couple of unique Japanese conditions that make all of this possible. Uh, number one is the political and economically or an, uh, political and economic stability of sort of this one-party system in Japan that lasts for quite a few decades at this point. So there are a few labor problems in Japan through this whole time period. Uh, the occupation plus the Japanese work ethic sort of leads to that company unions exist. Workers were willing to take lower wages for promises uh, that they would have jobs for life. Uh, so there are a few labor problems in Japan. None, none of these large-scale strikes that have happened in the United States in the early 20th century, the late 19th century, too. Um, so here's a word that I have trouble pronouncing. Kiritsu. This kiritsu, uh, this grouping or collection of companies that work together, sort of creating um, what we might think of as these, you know, trusts or monopolies, but not really. What they did is they strategized together. Uh, so these various companies do kind of mono monopolize collectively to control... Um, Qual uh, quality and prices. So it's not exactly a monopoly, but it's similar to a monopoly uh, where these companies come together. Uh, there's also government policies that are helping out with some very high tariffs. And tariffs, again, are taxes on imports, which are in the news every day today. Uh, but nobody says the word tariff anymore, and I don't know why not. So they do have a very high import tariff uh, to help Japanese uh, products be sold at cheaper uh, than foreign products in Japan. They also uh, have this revolutionized um, production methods in, in Japan. Uh, so the quality control with this karatsu system, and quality control is handled right on the factory floor. So they do have uh, a great deal of high quality products being produced in Japan. So this picture right here is a, a photograph not that long after the war, uh, after World War II of Tokyo which will let you know that they rebuild because pretty much all of Japan was completely destroyed uh, by some of the bombing campaigns during the war, which will shift us to the post-war international economy in Western Europe. 
Um, so we're going to go over a couple things here. Uh, the way economic unification happens in Western Europe, it begins with the Marshall Plan, which we'll remember um, is it requires cooperation where the United States would give money to some of these Western European nations so or for a couple of reasons, but mostly so they didn't fall to communism, but also to help them rebuild in general. <clears throat> we also get the European coal and steel community uh, that begins in 1951 with France, West Germany, Italy, Belgium, the Netherlands, and Luxembourg. And what this is is sort of just a cooperation between these countries and the coal and steel industries in these countries. Um, now, this this cooperation community uh, they don't it increases production because they don't have to compete with each other at least in these countries, which is most of Western Europe right here. Uh, next, we have the Treaty of Rome, which create is the creation of the European Economic Community, the EEC. Sometimes it's called the Common Market. <clears throat> it's created in 1957. Now, this is uh, the predecessor of the European Union common market. So this is the direct predecessor of that. Uh, what this is, is it's uh, they become one country. Most of Western Europe becomes one country economically, at least. There's no tariffs, no restrictions of capital or labor moving between these countries. Uh, you can One can cross a border for a job, for work or money. It keeps wages um pretty much the same around this economic community so there is this degree of um cooperation that becomes important in western europe after world war ii is over so here's just a, a picture uh, a map of some of the members who are involved you might be wondering why great britain didn't join uh they did try to join a few times in the 1960s uh, but it doesn't work all that well and there's debate today because they have since joined uh, the European Union, uh, but they just had their vote about leaving the European Union, which is still up for, you know, we're not sure what's going to happen there because it was a plebiscite, which means that it wasn't actually like law. They weren't voting for it. It was just people's wishes. So we'll see what happens there. France, for their part, uh, and Charles de Gaulle, who becomes the president of France, thought that the European Union was too close to the United States, but ended up joining in the 1970s. And by 1973, we get Great Britain, Ireland, Denmark all finally join uh, the European Union. Finally, there is a common currency that develops in 1999. The euro is the one that we know today, uh, where most of these, well, not most, yeah, most of these countries who are members of the European Union use the euro. Great Britain, stubborn as they are, haven't switched over, and they probably never will. Uh, the this economic community, uh, the EEC, does lose a little momentum in the 1970s and 80s. Norway and Sweden don't want to join at first. But the end of the Cold War does reinvigorate uh, this European common markets. So here's a slide that I just talked about, but I didn't actually click on. So Great Britain doesn't join because they're sort of on their own uh, terms. By 1973, they do join with Ireland and Denmark to uh, lose momentum in the 70s and 80s. But the end of the Cold War in the late 1980s, so like 1989 and you know into 1991, uh, the European common market is reinvigorated. Uh, now we got to talk a little bit about demographic transitions uh, in the Western world after World War II. We finally get this period of low death rates and low birth rates in the developed world. Uh, and that's due to uh, a, a number of reasons. And this is mostly we're talking about in Europe, uh, the United States, Australia, and Japan to so like westernized nations. Uh, the norm had always been high birth rates and high death rates. But now for the first time, we're getting low death rates and low birth rates in these developed uh, nations. This transition is currently underway in places like Latin America and China and India, uh, but they're not there yet. And just to come back and talk about uh, some of the different worlds uh, that exist in, during that developed during the Cold War, as we hear, we, we talk about the first world, and when we talk about the first world, we're talking about the United States, Japan, Australia, uh, Europe. When we talk about the second world, we're talking about places like Russia, uh, China, India, and then we have third world countries. We're talking about a lot of African countries and Latin American countries and some Asian countries. Uh, so that idea of the first world, second world, third world comes up during uh, this time frame to, to, differentiate, our, to differentiate ourselves uh, from the Soviet Union. I keep saying ourselves, the United States from the Soviet Union. And this goes along with that. So when we're talking about the developed world. We're talking about first world nations in this case, just to kind of put a label on it. So this transition uh, begins after World War II, and there's a couple of reasons why. 
Uh, number one, the eradication of numerous epidemic diseases was underway. Smallpox, cholera, and typhus had been major killers, but after World War II, uh, there's efforts made to eliminate these diseases. And smallpox, as far as I know, is the one of the you know it's been eliminated around the world. Nobody gets smallpox anymore. We don't even get a vaccine for it anymore. Uh, but by the 1970s, it had been eliminated. These other diseases do still exist. They just don't break out in the first world or in the developed world the way they do in third world nations. And there's also, <clears throat> we also get this period where famine sort of ends in the developed world, except in certain cases where the government is completely inept, like China in the early 60s, which we'll talk about uh, in next PowerPoint, next lecture, or persistent warfare, which parts of Africa and Latin America but mostly Africa have experienced over the last quarter century. Uh, so there are large scale famines still there, but there, you know, we don't starve to death generally in the United States or in Europe or Australia or Japan. We also get the decline of infant mortality, um, which goes along with this, you know, transition from high death and high birth rates to low birth and death rates uh, because of advances in medicine. So here's this uh, map that shows uh, infant mortality rates. Uh, the redder it is, the, the worse it is, and the bluer it is, the best, the better it is. So you can see that in uh, 19, between 1950 and 55, it's pretty good in most of Europe, uh, the Amer uh, North America, and Australia. Japan's getting there. Uh, today, you can see most of these you know, first and second world countries are doing pretty well with that. This one here is actually Afghanistan because there's been war there for about 20 years now. Uh, they're doing pretty poorly, but it's mostly African nations that are struggling today. Uh, so you can see sort of the shift in uh, from 1950 to 2010, you know, just seven years ago at this point that it, we're doing better as, an, as a world. Um, so this birth rate decline in the developed world is a result, a direct result of industrialization. The family uh, no longer needs to be a unit of production. Big families are not uh, an economic advantage anymore. And there's a reason for this when most of the world is based on agriculture and there's more farmers than industrial workers, you need big families because you need children to work on the farm with you uh, so you can produce more. But once mechanization takes over, you don't need as many people on the farms and people start moving to the cities. It's no longer an advantage to have a big family because you have more mouths to feed, but you're not directly producing uh, the food. And so that's no longer desirable to have these uh, large-scale families. And we we'll see, you know, the founding of the United States, most women would have six or seven or eight children in their lifetimes. Some of them would survive, about four or five would survive. Uh, but now it's, it's less than that. It's much less than that. I think the average is about two children uh, per family. And that's just the average. You know, sometimes it's less. Sometimes it's more in the developed world. There's also this rapid expansion of the global economy after uh, 1945. The benefits are unevenly distri distributed and the benefits mostly go to uh, some of these westernized nations uh, the you know, Japan and the United States and Europe and Australia uh, benefit way more than countries in Africa do or in Latin America and as we go through the semester we'll talk about that a little bit more and as part of this rise of the global economy we get for the first time the development of this consumer uh, economy sometimes we can call it a consumer revolution a lot of people who have written books have called it that. It's led by the United States, followed soon thereafter by places uh, like Western Europe or Japan, Australia, like we have listed up here. To a lesser extent, the Soviet Union and communist Eastern Europe, uh, for a long time, they don't experience much of much of this consumer revolution. But there's a couple of reasons uh, for this. And some of these uh, uh, developments are important technological changes uh, which maybe some of our chemistry majors or engineers could explain on uh, the weekly discussion questions. Uh, feel free to jump in if I'm getting this this wrong or if I you have more to add. But polymer chemistry uh, develops after World War II, and this is the science of large molecules. And what this is is develop uh, synthetic materials which weren't uh, you couldn't really do on large scale before. But we're talking here t developing synthetic rubber or drugs, penicillin being one of them excuse me, fibers, different types of plastics. Um, that's all the polymer chemistry, which develops on large scale after World War II. Uh, electrical power is another big one, which begins a little bit earlier, but it's not a widespread in widespread use until after World War II, uh, or during World War II, and definitely after, though. 
Uh, and this this helps create products that were uh, creates products that require electricity. Things like microwaves, my favorites, um, appliance, uh, other appliances, washers and dryers, uh, uh, electric stoves rather than rather than gas stoves, uh, lights in the house in general rather than candles. Uh, it reduces labor for domestic chores, which helps out women a lot, and it transforms leisure activity for the first time in history. Leisure is becoming uh, available to a lot of different people. And we'll go over uh, some of these things here. So here's a family sitting in front of the, the little tiny television that's probably smaller than what you're watching this on right now, probably smaller than, than your computer. I mean, maybe if you're watching on your phone, it's bigger than that. But so there's televisions are being developed. Uh, automobiles are being developed. We, we associate early automobiles um, like with the Model T and Henry Ford or the assembly line in the early 20th century, but they are becoming much more popular after World War II uh, because people are moving out of the cities again to the suburban areas like we talked about on the last PowerPoint. And people need automobiles to get places. Also, when you have an automobile, you can drive to a vacation destination. Uh, so like a beach area or an amusement park, which uh, are all becoming more and more popular after World War II. Um, advertising drives this whole consumer revolution and there you know here's a an advertisement of an automobile right here and we see advertising all the time uh, in fact at the time of recording this the, the super bowl was just sort of a big deal when it comes to advertising uh five million dollars for a 30 second commercial i mean that's kind of ridiculous but advertising is becoming much much more prominent after world war ii uh, and as part of this consumer society we get the development of shopping malls uh, for the first time, or shopping centers, I guess this isn't a mall just yet, it's a more of a strip mall. Uh, but these shopping centers where you can go to buy uh, your food or your clothes or whatever, which in the before time, before World War II, you would have to go into the city to do this. But now that everybody's living in a suburb, these strip malls are becoming more and more prominent. So people who live in the suburbs can go shop in the suburbs. And for the first time, we're getting a lot of firsts here. Uh, credit cards are becoming more and more popular. Uh, and these drive the consumer economy. You can go into debt to participate in the consumer economy for the first time. And you guys have probably seen most of these examples here. The Diners Club International Card. I bet maybe your grandfather has one of those, but you would never run into one uh, in your life. So these are still the you know credit companies that exist today, except for the Diners Club, because who has a Diners Club card anymore? I think of Steve Martin in Trains, Planes, and Automobiles from the late 80s when he tries to give his his diner's club card to the to the hotel owner. So anyway, uh, everybody can participate in the economy. Uh, you can go into debt if you have to do it. So I think that's uh, pretty important to note. And the credit cards will bring us to the end of part one of the post-war international economy. We'll pick up on the uh, next PowerPoint, which you'll see right below this one. So I'll see you there.